the bedoa let us pray most loving gracious heavenly father we thank you for this blessed day again to be in your house to worship you lord jesus thank you for the passages that were read to us from the scripture the enlightenment the excitement that we can draw from these uh, passages as we go through the different challenges in life we want to thank you lord jesus help us not to quit but to persevere reminding ourselves of your greatness of your calling a lord and also the many different ways you have showered upon us grace upon grace and have seen us through every circumstances of life as we go on may your grace upon grace continue to envelop us come lord be in our midst this morning continue to be present o lord to speak to us as we ponder the scriptures as we praise and worship you as we sing hymns to you lord jesus and also as we come to fellowship with you through the sacrament now i pray o god that you hide thy servant under the shadow of thy cross and bring forth your words to us afresh this morning encouraging us strengthening us challenging us to move on and not quit due to the discouragements that come every now and then come lord take your place in jesus name we ask and pray amen great to be in the house of the lord we take this uh, i take this opportunity to wish all our chinese brothers and sisters a very blessed and happy chinese uh, new year what a beautiful country we are in huh? amidst all our diversities we are able to celebrate each other's uh, festival one of the blessed country which has got the most uh, public holidays i guess that we enjoy <laughs> thank god for all these blessings that we have friends uh, the theme or the title of my sermon to you this morning is do not lose heart or do not quit move on and the lord will see you through the passages that are read to us this morning from the old testament to kings 2 1 to 12 we have the incident which elisha witness elijah taken up by chariots of fire chariots of horses and uh, fire and they had to go through different uh, places Bethel, Jericho, Gilga, three different places, yet reminding Elijah last moments to complete that task given to him, Elisha to learn from his mentor, from his guru, and to seek a double portion of his spirit so that he can continue the ministry of uh, Uh, Elijah or the ministry that Elijah was uh, doing what an enlightenment that would have been for Elisha to witness the taking up of uh, Elijah chariots of fire horses with the chariots of fire imagine the awe that Elisha would have felt and the awesome god that he is called to serve what an encouragement that would have been to elisha to carry on the ministry of uh, elijah i am sure he was aware elijah running away from the threat of jezebel all that is there amidst all weaknesses amidst all challenges that are there we see elijah persevering and elisha continuing drawing enlightenment joy excitement amidst all challenges to persevere and not to quit not to lose heart then when we come to the sum appointed for us this morning 
we see the mighty one, the God, the mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. Verse 4, he summons the heavens above and the earth that he may judge his people. Five gathers to me my consecrate gather to me my consecrated one who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, for God himself is the judge. From the rising of the sun to the place it sets. God is a God who speaks, God is a God who summons. He will not be silent, and there is a fire that will devour. And around him are temples of rages. A God who is alive, a God who is active in creation, a God who is active in the midst of his people, who communicates to them, who judges them, also gives an awesome or feeling of the presence of God. A God who summons the sun, the moon, the cosmic world, is the God whom we believe and serve. What an encouragement that would have been to the psalmist as he depicts God in that powerful manner. Then we go to the Gospel account, Mark chapter Nine. We'll come to the epistle later because my sermon is from that. Mark chapter 9 verses 2 to 9 speaks about the transfiguration of uh, Christ. The transfiguration of Christ. Suddenly, Jesus Christ was transfigured. Bright, light, shining like a cloud that was there enveloping them. Light was shining. Moses, Elijah were there encouraging Jesus for the task or mission that Jesus has before him, preparing him for the crucifixion. What a joy and excitement that would have been to the three disciples who were there witnessing this transfiguration of Christ. God calls us in many different ways and reveals himself to us also in many different creative ways. Light shining. And that light amidst the weaknesses of the disciples were there to see them to even die the death of a martyr. Such strong faith they had. They were men full of weaknesses. They denied. But yet, they died a martyr's death. They were looking forward for positions, important positions, ambitious people as well, right and left. But yet, the light that radiated the glory of Jesus to them enlightened them challenge them to even die the death of a martyr, to stand firm, steadfast in their faith, to move on, continuing the mission of uh, Christ. Now coming to our epistle reading, Paul goes on to encourage us not to lose heart, not to quit, but to persevere. He too saw the light, where did he see the light? When he was on his way to Damascus. He had a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that changed the course of his life. A complete change, transform a transformation took place in his life. Like he was transfigured from the old self to a new self with a new nature, with a new mission to accomplish the works of uh, Christ. There were many reasons 
for discouragements in Paul's uh, situation, many challenges, that he, if gave importance to it, would have uh, quit, but he did not. We find that the great apostle did not quit. Verse 16, let me read to you. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Above that are the challenges that he faced. But he continues to say in verse 16, eh? Therefore, we do not lose heart. What was it that kept him from quitting or from losing heart? As you study the scripture, we come to understand that he knew what he possessed in Jesus Christ, what he had in the Lord Jesus Christ, what he had received from the Lord Jesus Christ. So instead of complaining about what he did not have, Paul rejoiced in what he had. And you and I can learn to do the same thing. We may look at the world around us and say, oh, he is more privileged than me. He has this and that. He is talented, he is gifted and so on. But we must look at ourselves and see what has God given us to use it for, to glorify him. What can I do? What has God blessed me with? I'm sure God has got many blessings in all our life. We must look into what we have and use it to glorify God. Paul had many reasons, as I told you, to lose heart, to quit, but he did not. So as we go through challenges, the devil may force us to be exempt. We want to lose heart and we want to give up. We are demoralized and discouraged by where we are right now. But here comes a challenge to us. Through the apostle, the great apostle, a man weak like us, who had some weaknesses in his body and he prayed three times asking God to remove that thorn that was there. Was it removed? No. He had to live with that thorn. But then Jesus reminded him, my grace is sufficient for you. He had to persevere amidst that thorn, that suffering, that pain that was there, pricking him every now and then. But yet, the words of Jesus, my grace is sufficient for you, enabled him to persevere. So instead of complaining, about what he did not have, he rejoiced in what he had. So we too can learn from Paul to see within us what are the blessings that we have than to praise God using that we have. I'm sure you're aware of the illustration. Huh? The fellow who did not have a shoe was complaining and then he saw there's another fellow who did not have legs to wear that shoe. Fellow going in car was complaining he wants to change his car. And then he saw someone on a cycle. Fellow who wanted to buy a house was complaining. And then he saw someone lying on the platform without a house. All this tends to remind us to appreciate what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what kind of ministry did Paul have? that caused him discouragement many a times, but also the presence of God with him to encourage him. The kind uh, of ministry uh, that he did is made clear to us in the previous chapters, chapters 3, 2, and uh, 1. The glorious ministry to which he was uh, called a glorious ministry that brings life to people that brings salvation to people that makes people righteous to turn away from their wickedness a ministry that brings about transformation in the lives of people he considers this ministry a gift from God. How precious do you consider the giftings or talents that God has given you? Dear Paul considers this ministry that God has given to him as a gift so precious that amidst the challenges 
he still is able to look up to God and persevere. The way you look at it will also determine how you will fulfill it. If Paul had looked at his ministry as a burden, then it would have resulted in a lot of dissatisfaction and complaints. Some people look at this at, as a punishment from God. So therefore, they will not experience any joy in fulfilling that calling that God had given to them. Paul, here we see, was overwhelmed by the grace and the mercy of God. His positive attitude had some good practical consequences, uh, consequences in uh, life. So we want to look at three things in Paul's life here. Firstly, it kept him from being a quitter. Secondly, it kept him from being a deceiver. Thirdly, it kept him from being a self-promoter. Firstly, it kept him from being a quitter. In verse 8 and 9, we read the difficulties, the challenges that came to him. Let me read to you verse 8 and 9. We are hard-pressed on every side. Hard-pressed on every side. Let that be somewhere there in your mind. But not crushed. Perplexed. But not in despair. Persecuted. But not abandoned. Struck down. But not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. See the situa situation that he was in, how he depicts it to us. Not in a negative sense, but in a positive sense. That amidst such situation, he did not quit. What kept him from quitting? Hard press on every side. Not crushed. Perplexed but not in despair. Persecuted, not abandoned. Struck down but not destroyed. As he highlights his difficulties, his challenges and his feelings to us, he reminds us he too was a human like us, subject to all human fraternities. But he did not quit because with the divine calling came the divine enabling grace of God, which he experienced every now and then. He was confident that God will see him through in all this situation. The calling that he had, the light that he saw at his con conversion on the road to Damascus changed him completely. Alexander White, the great Scottish preacher, once told a pastor who wanted to quit, don't quit. The angels around the throne of God envy you and your work. The angels around the throne of God envy you and the great work that you are doing. Because they cannot do that work. They can only do what God asks them to do. Otherwise they are there worshipping him in his throne. But you and I have got a special privilege to serve God in a very creative way here on earth. To glorify his name here on earth. Paul's encouragement came from the grace of God. He reminded himself of God's grace, of his calling. The light that shone on him, that kept him going on amidst all this uh, difficulty. Then in verse 2 and 4, we see that it kept him from being a deceiver. His calling, the light that he received, the enlightenment that he had, kept him from being a deceiver. Let me read that verse to you. Verse 2, verse 4. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so 
that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Many false teachers claim to base their teachings on the word of God. They have nothing else. But again, use the word of God to teach people. But false teachers handle God's word in deceptive way. They take the words out of context to explain it to the people in their own uh, understanding. So they distort the word of God. In the Garden of Eden, who distorted the word of God? The serpent as it came to Eve distorted the word of God. Didn't God say so creatively, deceptively, he spoke and Eve was uh, deceived, followed by Adam too. Paul had nothing to hide in his personal life. Some people hide their own personal experiences. Here is a man who does not hide it. I've got a weakness. I've got a thorn in my flesh. I prayed. God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Human being like, the, like us. But there are many people in this world who will hide their personal experiences. They will not share. He did not hide his personal life, nor his preaching. He was open and honest, and there was no deception or distortion in what he preached. Then why were the false teachers successful? Wasn't Paul successful? He was. But he had to endure a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a lot of challenges. These false teachers, their minds were blinded by Satan and they find it easier to believe a lie than the truth. That is how the father of lies will work. Blinding people's minds and hearts to the truth of God, to follow his deceptive way so that they distort the truth and deceive the people who are listening to them. Scripture must be interpreted correctly using the methods that are there. Otherwise, it will be a heresy. They, then why were they so successful? Because they surrendered their minds and hearts to the father of lies and were blinded so they could not see the truth that God wants them to receive. Verse 3 and 4 tells us that very clearly. Their minds are veiled because the blindness of their heart. Paul has seen the light of Christ at his conversion and had a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that kept him going. That kept him steadfast in the word of God. Allowing the word to interpret itself for the purpose it was intended. So as we also read the word of God, we don't read ourselves, our circumstances into it, but we allow the word of God to speak to us in our own circumstances at, as it stands in the scriptures. Paul kept himself from being a quitter, did not quit, did not lose heart amid such challenges. He kept himself from being a deceiver, from being deceived. Thirdly and finally, he kept himself from being a self-promoter. The Judaizers enjoyed preaching about themselves and glorifying in their achievement. That's what the Pharisee also did, isn't it? When he went up to the temple to pray, came to the front, boasting about himself. I did this, I did that, I do this, I do that. Whereas the tax collector did not come to the front, had no hard to even uh, raise his face up, but then with its bowed on, bat his chest and prayed, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful to me, a sinner. And we know whose prayer was heard. God is against those who are proud. God is against those who boast themselves. But he lifts the humble heart. And Lent is a season that is coming from Ash Wednesday 
to remind us that we are nothing but dust. They were not servants of God who tried to help people. They were dictators who expected people to follow them and exploited them. Paul practiced genuine humility. He did not trust himself or commend himself or preach about himself, as verse 5 tells us. He just preached about Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ crucified and did not boast about who he was, his standing in society as a Roman, as a well-educated man who studied 12 years under the feet of Gamaliel himself, the scholar, Pharisee, all that privileges he had, qualifications he had, but he counted all them nothing. Reminding himself that he had received this ministry from Christ, this reminder kept him from being a quitter. God has called me. He has commissioned me. I shall not quit. And I will be sincere, honest, with the fear of God as to how I interpret the word of God that is given to me. That kept him from promoting himself as well. Paul could have built around him a fan club. A fan club. I am the follower of Paul. How many followers do I have? Today people like to check their Facebook, isn't it? When they put a command to check every now and then. How many comments I have received? How many fans I have received? How many people appreciate my commands? We have got a lot of fans following us today. But Paul did not create a fan club like the Judaists, like the Pharisees, the scribes of his time. Focused on God. So we are also reminded today, amidst the challenges that are there before us, the difficulties, the pain, the suffering, the health conditions that we go through in our lives today, let us focus on Christ who had called us, who had died for us, who had empowered us, who had showered upon us grace upon grace, holding our hand, sometimes shouldering us and seeing us through in life's situation. Our focus should be on Jesus, not in the world. If we look at the world, look at the surrounding, what happened to Peter when he walked on the water will happen to us. The moment he took his eyes from Jesus and saw the big waves that were hitting him, he started sinking, drowning. And when he cried out, Jesus just lifted him up. And I used to say that he was just an arm throw from Jesus. So close to Jesus. Yet, when the focus was away from Jesus, he started drowning. We can follow Jesus closely. But if our focus is not on him, then we too, like Peter, go very close to him. Arm throw only. Jesus just lifted him up. We can also drown him my friends. In conclusion, what happens when you share Jesus Christ with others? What happens when you share the gospel? What happens when you sow the seed of the gospel? The light of Jesus begins to shine in them. You may not see the results immediately, but the seed is already sown. Therefore, we need to draw encouragement today. You may be doing a lot of work, serving the Lord in many different ways. You do not see the results. You do not see people praising you, appreciating you. You don't see people coming to Jesus Christ, but the seed is already sown. And that will grow. The Holy Spirit will bring about growth. And it will grow. A time will come when they will testify, praising God. When I was a little child, this teacher taught me. When I came to church, this brother, this sister shared the gospel to me. When I was going through these struggles, these pains, this emotional stress, this person was there for me to listen to me, 
to pray for him. At that time, God's name will be glorified through your deeds. The transfiguration of Christ, which has enlightened you, will also enlighten the person to whom you share the gospel. Imagine the awe, the wonder, the excitement Elisha would have had when he saw Elijah taken up in that form. Imagine the psalmist as he pictures God commanding, creating, controlling the universe and also mindful of people that he has created. Imagine the joy, the excitement the disciples had in the transfiguration of Christ, which also amidst their weaknesses, amidst their failures, enabled them to stand firm, steadfast in their faiths. Creation was in chaos in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. God had already created everything, but something took place and there was chaos, disorder. Verse 2 tells us, God created. The Lord said this, the Lord said that, and everything was uh, formed. God began to form, to fill, and to bring order to the earth that was void and orderless and brought about a new creation. And man was put there to take care of it. So, likewise, when we share the gospel, we allow God to bring about a new creation of that soul, of that person, of that life into the kingdom of God. Let God do His work. Let us do our part. So, friends, there's a lot of encouragement that we can draw from the life of the apostle, great apostle St. Paul. But for us this morning, let us be reminded, amidst all that you are going through, do not quit, do not lose heart. Draw encouragement from the word of God, from the experiences of Paul the apostle. What kept him from quitting? What kept him from being a deceiver? what kept him from being a self-promoter. It is easy to succumb to all this, but what kept him? May that God, may that enlightenment that God has given us, the calling that he has given us to be his children, and that grace that he has showered upon us, see us through in all life situations. God be with you. Let us pray. Father, as we go through many painful situations in life, challenges, and also sometimes health conditions, disappointments, discouragements, hurt feelings, we pray, O oh God, that your promises in Scripture would pop up alive in our lives, challenging us not to quit, but to move on, putting our faith in you. May this scriptures be the enlightenments in our life that can encouraging that can encourage us to persevere, to move on. And today, as we have also seen Elijah's departure, God, who is the creator, who controls the universe, and everything is at his command but yet mindful of us, whose light continues to shine. And may the transfiguration of Christ also enlighten us. And may Paul's life experiences be a challenge to us, a motivation to us to persevere faithfully until we breathe our last. Into thy hands we commend ourselves. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen.